All right, Monday night, 6.30 Central Standard Time. That means for Green Oaks Gaming, it is time to journey into the game worlds that we create. So this is an ongoing series. If you're just catching this now, go back and watch the previous videos. Some of them will be on our Twitch stream, on our video on demand. If they're older than about two weeks, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So make sure to check out all of our socials, of course. Give us a follow to help us grow and gain new followers for the community. We're not looking for subscriptions. We just are hoping to get more followers so that we can reach more people and hopefully provide good quality content to people who are interested in RPGs and RPG aids. Especially with this series where we're looking at diving into the actual exploration of building and exploring and creating and experiencing content in RPG game worlds. Now on the large map you can see, or the large screen, you can see our large map of our world. Uh, the previous videos we've really dived into the continent of Vorlant as we're building a campaign that is going to be a level 1 to 20 campaign. We've pulled out some of the GM tools that are available on our Patreon. If you are a patron, uh, if you have any questions on those, don't hesitate. Leave a message in the chat and I'll be happy to answer those. When we last left off, we built our first adventuring day, which is designed to take our first level adventures from first to second level after a day's worth of adventures and really kind of targeting that evening into night adventure so that we could really pull out the stops and have some uh, combat encounters with more nocturnal beings. And initially, when I first started this, we started with just the name and theme and kind of the start of the campaign. We'll do a quick summary on what we've done so far. So the campaign is named Whispers of the Lost. The theme overall, the entirety of it, is destruction of beauty. So the destruction of beauty. It starts with a prophecy. A spear in the night sky will signal a fog that will forever engulf the world. Heralded with silence by the broken flock of birds. And only the wasted dead can show how to prevent it. So the goal is ultimately a containment of Gehenna kind of is the is the goal of this adventure. So we broke it down into our tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four. We're focusing on tier one. And we broke up the aspects of our overarching story into those tier pieces. So with tier one, we're looking for player characters to be local heroes. So we had to put up some type of a task. Someone wants something. And this is all pulled from How to Be a Great GM. Um, I really like the style that uh, is used to build that kind of premise of what the adventure story is about. So Renko wants security for the city of Goldgate by summer. He's having difficult getting it using the people because of massive storms. So the storms are what drive the characters into one location to meet Renko, who is the patron. The theme on this tier is all about vulnerability of the meek. Because we want these stories to focus on becoming local heroes, the thought process is really to make the character stand out as a cut above the locals. So the locals are pretty meek, trading mercantile working doc uh, managing type of persons so Renko who is the de facto town uh, official is now that these heroes have stumbled into the town and um, have been forced into the location because of storms he is hoping that he can use them to get security for the city of Goldgate by summer so the nemesis for this tier is not initially, we put varied. Uh, the patron is Renko. Um, going back to the nemesis, 
the reason I put varied is because I have different aspects that I want to explore in the different adventuring days. So when we built out what our adventuring days look like for the first level, an adventuring day is going to take one day, about six um, encounters to level up to level two. And level two will also take a day. Level three is going to take about a day and a half, and level four is going to take 2.2 days. And so really looking at it, I looked at clearing the canals as one adventure location, so the canals of the city, uh, clearing the sewers, clearing the nearby woods, and clearing the nearby hills. So all very local and contained. We did just a really quick map of the area. I have been working on it, but I don't have it finalized yet. You can see it's just lightly penciled in, um, all based off of just a quick pencil doodle we did on camera. So this is the region that I have got to ink in yet. Um, this will be done by the next cast. Now on the back side, I started doing the city proper of Goldgate. Again, I started with just quick pencil doodles and um, thinking about the canals, thinking about sewers, uh, thinking about how to utilize those in-game aspects to make a full adventuring day and to create some interesting encounters that aren't just combat related. So all focused on this initial location. So we completed building out um, clearing the canals. We had that, we decided that's going to be our first adventure. So the first adventure, the adventurers are going to go and clear out the canals. We came up with some great aspects for um, some checks that will be some of the encounters they do, uh, managing the boat, the gondola that they're on, uh, and then uh, some, some foes to contend with. So we did some tying it back into the mercantile piece, the merchant uh, aspect of it. We've got some black marketers that are trying to slip by as the sun goes down. We also have some cultists that are going to be an aspect of that adventure. And the thought was, as we're looking at the canals, it was because I wanted to start with the canals rather than the sewers, something is pushing the sewer dwelling creatures out into the canals and that's causing the city to be unsafe. So kind of working backwards, what pushed the creatures into the canals is going to be an adventure. What pushed those creatures from the woods into the sewers? And then what pushed those creatures from the um, hills into the woods? That kind of aspect. I want to build it up. I want to have everything tie in. And as I was going through, I came up with a great idea on a different show. Um, because we built some villains on our Wednesday night show that are Goblin Boss Brothers on wargs. And they're really cool miniatures, got me thinking about how I can utilize these. And the thought came to me that the goblins are the ones in the hills. They're the kind of instigator, so they will actually be the um, primary antagonists for this tier one. Because they're spreading out from the hills into the forest, the cultists are going into the sewers, the sewer creatures are going into the canals, causing the entire city to not be safe, and the meek of the city are really being affected. So it all plays into it really, really well. For our tier one, ultimately, the player should have to confront the goblins who are the primary antagonists causing this entire chain reaction into the canals. So as I'm building the adventure, things are coming more and more clear on this first tier. Um, and then I need to also be aware of how some of those aspects are going to play into the other tiers because I only have my backbone, my overall story of uh, containing Gehenna. Now I'm kind of filling in the blanks and I don't want it to be too railroady. I want to have connections and breadcrumbs, but I want to be able to be nimble enough that if my players decide they don't want to investigate the hills and see what's causing them to do, 
or what's causing all the havoc in the city, you know, by default, I'm not going to make them go and confront these goblins, but I will have those aspects continue to come up in some way, shape, or form down the road. So I've got to be nimble enough to be able to tie those elements in because I don't want them to get to the end game and say, well, that had nothing to do with the canals. Why did we do the canals? I want there to be some type of a connection. So as we get into the uh, hills, I'm hoping to have a good idea on how that moves into uh, our tier two where we're looking at heroes of this realm. So I've got to continue looking at the bigger picture and the bigger picture and the bigger picture. Um, but right now we're just really focused on this first tier and looking at it overall. So today we're going to be building the level two adventure and ultimately you could put all of these into I guess one um, adventure series uh, which we may do uh, but I like to plan them out by level just so you're not in the middle of a game or a session and having to level up if I can avoid it. Now depending on how pacing and everything goes sometimes you can't Again, being nimble is super, super key. But I want to build today an adventure for level two characters uh, that is going to be actually clearing the sewers. And while I'm here, I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to update this and we'll actually use a pen because now that I've got a good firm grasp, so day one is clearing the canals, day two, sewers or level two I should say um, this is the woods and this is the hills and we'll put woods slash fields so that's the story progression the adventure progression how we're going to move our characters in from one aspect to another we get a little light on there just so we can see it a little bit better. I hope that's coming up clear on your screen. If not, just in chat, let me know if you need me to pull it up to the camera so you can see things more clearly, should you so choose. Now, because we've got just a rough draft of our city, the sewers are actually going to kind of find or follow the path where the canals are not. So that's kind of the premise. I'm not going to map out the sewers to a big degree. I want the um, I want to have a good idea of them, so I'm going to sketch them, uh, just a rough sketch. But I'm not actually going to map them out. If my players so choose to map them out so they don't get lost, that's great. But I'm not going to require it. So for my game aids, I'm going to grab a couple of things. This is my adventuring day planner. And then I also have my CR rating and quantity master sheet. Now these forms are available on my Patreon. If you want to check them out closer to the camera, just let me know. Um, but we are going to start working on filling these bad boys in and um, still following the same process that we did. We know uh, because this is our level two, we're going to pop that in. Level two, the environment, we know this is going to be in the sewers. Now the theme is not going to change. The theme of our story is still vulnerability of the meek. Now for this breadcrumb, while they were in level one, the characters encountered cultists. And there will be clues that they are getting into the sewers, um, as well as a bigger piece that they're being pushed out of the woods. So that's why they're trying to get um, quick, easy, secret access into the sewers. So. I've got to lay enough breadcrumbs in that first adventure to get the uh, party to want to go into the sewers. Now if not, then as they're talking with their patron, the patron can say, you know, there were some funny things going on 
uh, at a couple of the sewer access points. Why don't you go in and investigate and see if there's a problem because that's where the snakes ultimately are had come from as well as the sturge uh, swarms. So big access points for those characters to be able to do. The adventuring days, we know this is going to take one day for them to go from level two to level three. And then any considerations that I want to put in. And I don't have any immediately. I know that I want to have uh, the cultists, but they're new to sewers. Now that's important for me because I don't want to only have a cultist encounter. I don't want it to just be uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I want other things that are still, uh, you know, fit in that sewer environment just to change some things up for my player characters. Now we need to start looking at how many encounters are we going to have in our adventuring day. So the way this process works, if we want to have a deadly encounter, it's going to take up a you know, more than half of our of our allotted encounter uh, numbers. Um, if we have hard, that's going to take up one third. Uh, if we have medium, one six. If we have easy, one twelfth. So really deciding how many types of encounters and how difficult those encounters we want to have is going to be an important aspect. Now, as I think about it, the party has just run through the canals, they'll probably take a long rest at the inn, and then most likely the next day or afternoon want to venture into the sewers. So we've got some good idea initially, and it could change that they'll go into the sewers in midday. Again, this is all relative because the players may catch me off guard and want to wait two days before they venture into the sewers because they want to go and just continue checking the canals. Maybe they'll want to go investigate the port. Who knows? Who knows what the players are going to do? We don't know. We can only plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? So hoping for the best, I'm going to go through and build this adventure thinking they're going to, build, they're going to go into the sewers midday. So looking at my encounter build uh, chart, I can see when we get into level two, we start moving up into the CR thing. If we have a hard or a deadly encounter, uh, we're starting to look at more one and two CR and even up to four CR rated monsters. So really at this point, I need to grab the monster manual because as we're looking at those encounters we want to really see what type of encounter do we want to do and additionally because I've got my monster manual I also have my DM's guide so that we can quickly reference areas just like we did last time what monster ratings by area um, by style so going the same exact way we did last time I'm looking a little bit at urban and I know already I want to have some type of cultists and based on that your cultists are 1 8 CR rating um, but I don't want to only have that type of You've got a cult fanatic at a CR2, a cult fanatic at a CR2. So one thing I want to do is, with my chart, look and see on level two, where does a CR2 monster fall? If you have one, it's an easy. If you have two, it's deadly. That's a deadly encounter. Do we have two cult fanatics for our party to contend with? If so, that's a huge aspect of their adventuring day. Two cult fanatics takes up a huge aspect of their adventuring day. If we're going to commit to that, then it takes it down to where we have, I mean, just one, two, 
four or three other encounters. How long of an adventuring day, how many encounters do we want to do? That can be kind of challenging. Do you want to stretch this out or have it be a more impactful, fast-paced item? Horrible as it sounds, I like the thought of them having a deadly encounter. Now, they didn't have a deadly encounter last time. They had a hard encounter at first level. I'm going to not pull any punches, and I'm going to do a deadly encounter. And I'm going to have two cult fanatics. Now, ultimately, depending on how you want to do it, you could have one cult fanatic and then use the additional XP to build out some additional henchmen or anything like that. I try to keep things as simple as possible for myself so I don't have to do a whole lot of additional work to contend with. So only about three to five times in a campaign will I do that, and generally in the mid-tiers. I don't do a whole lot deeper dive on this first tier. This is where we're all establishing the interactions with players. So I want this to really get the dynamics of the group together and not really use my platform to uh, challenge them more strategically or dynamically when they don't have those mechanics figured out yet. So that's why I'm keeping things super, super simple here. But because we're doing a deadly, we know all of these are off the table. Now we got to decide, are we going to do one hard? No, I want to have more than just two encounters in the day. And I want to have more than two mediums. So that leaves me with the thought of, do we have two easy, a medium, and a deadly? Or do we have four easy and a deadly? So easy encounter at level two, we get into um, CR... Uh, and we could go up to a CR2, a single CR2, um, and have another cult fanatic, but it would be an easy, just a single easy encounter. Hmm. Let's see. As we're in these sewers, trying to think of keeping some more sewer-esque, you know, rats of swarms, things like that. Um, and we know we have poisonous sta snakes that came out of the sewers. I'm thinking alligators in the sewers, things like that. Um, I don't want to keep it all cultists. So I do want to have some cultists, though, and they are one eighth. So I'm actually going to take out and have four mediums and one deadly. That's going to be the encounter for this day. I'm going to spend time utilizing their interactions in exploring and navigating the sewers and really push them to spend time developing some type of rapport with each other as they're trudging through these sewers. So I'm going to have four easy and one deadly encounter for the adventuring day. They're not going to spend a huge long time in there. So for an easy, I know I want to have some cultists. And this is going to be, they're going to come across nine cultists, nine of them, uh, which is quite a few. I mean, even with, so I've built this for a party of six. With a party of six, you're still able to use some of your tactic aspects as a GM to really challenge them and utilize some of their aspects, whether it's feats, um, spells, uh, whatever the case may be. So that's a pretty good standard there. Um, now let's see, also for easy, we could do, um, let's see what we have in a CR2 rating. We've got a bandit captain, cult fanatic, gargoyle, ghast, mimic, priest, were rat will o wisp now the were rat could fit underground in the sewers you know this is a port city a were rat fits pretty good but i don't want to put a were rat in yet because i don't anticipate my players having silvered weapons or anything like that so i'm going to avoid the were rat 
um, I'm just not really feeling, I mean, we could do just a single cult fanatic again. That's a question mark. I'll put it in there, but it's a question mark. Um, let's go with, if we go with uh, one half CR rating, and there we've got crocodiles, two of them, two crocodiles. I like that because it goes back to that alligators in the sewers that I want to have. I want to have alligators in the sewers. Um, and that's uh, CR one half rating. Uh, let's see, additionally in there you've got giant wasp, shadow, a swarm of insects, thug, and warhorse. I'm not feeling it. Let's go down to uh, CR one quarter. You've got an acolyte, draft horse, giant centipede could be good. A uh, giant poisonous snake. You know, we just fought some of those in the canals, so you could do it and tie it in really easy, but I don't want to repeat. You've got Kenku, Pseudo Dragon, Riding Horse, Skeleton, Smoke Mephit. Swarm of Bats is good. Swarm of Rats is good. Swarm of Ravens, no. Winged Kobold, no. Zombie, no. I want to avoid the undead here. So I am thinking I've got one, possibly two left. I am feeling giant centipedes and swarm of rats, one of those two. Um, now because it's one quarter, that would be five, five swarms of rats is a lot, I feel. Five swarms of rats. Yeah, that's a lot. And we could have them get into an area where all of these rats come swarming um, if we have yeah, I actually, I'm thinking numbers here. I'm playing a numbers game. We've got a high l number of cultists. We've got the challenging two cult fanatics. We've got a single cult fanatic and two crocodiles. I am thinking five swarms of rats. And I'm thinking having them go into an area that um, looks and feels open, but then swarms. So like they're in the center of this larger area and all of a sudden from different directions come these swarms of rats. I like the thought of that and then them having to contend with all these rats is pretty interesting. Um, your one tank is not going to hold the line on this. So I think it's a I think that's a really good challenge. Even though it's an easy challenge, it's a good, interesting one to build up some tension and really challenge the players on their uh, on their interactions with each other as well because they do have to work as a team to make sure that the lowest person doesn't get out and the strongest person is just not able to contain at all. So I like the thought of that. Um, now, the giant centipedes is pretty interesting, but I do like the rats better. So... Let's do a quick review. We've got five swarms of rats. We've got two crocodiles. We've got a cult fanatic. We've got uh, cultists, and we've got two cult fanatics together. So I'm already thinking um, this guy is late. I want to have this guy here have some type of info on him leading to... Um, cultists. I want to have the crocodiles be the first encounter. As they're traversing and going through, um, I want to have an area where the crocodiles, they have to contend with crossing some of the um, sewage uh, and have the crocodiles be what they have to contend with. Uh, the swarms of rats, I will have that be. Hmm. I'm going to make this cultist, the single cultist, the second. Because he's running late, he's on his way to uh, join the cultists. Uh, and then our swarm of rats is going to be three, four, 
and then we'll end it with a bang with that deadly encounter of two cult fanatics. I think that's a pretty good play. I think that's a really good play. And to bring this all home, what we've got to do is get our sheets to fill out the encounters. We've got one, two, three, four different ones. So we'll need four different sheets. And we've got five encounters, but the cult fanatic, I'm going to use the same one, the same sheet, because your stats are going to be the same. Now the cultists, we already have a sheet from our first adventure. We could reuse it and just up the number of cultists that are on that sheet. But because I'm stubborn, I'll just say it, uh, I want to have these separated out by adventure. So I can put these in a manila envelope um, and have them each adventure be separate even though they're going to be together. So we'll have one uh, manila envelope, the second one, the third, the fourth, and then that'll be our first tier adventures. Also because at some point I do hope to get all of this transferred into a printable PDF on DMs Guild, which you can find some of our products on there under either Joe Oaks or Green Oaks Gaming. Um, I believe we even have one under Green Oaks RPG Aids, but if you're ever interested. Um, so let's start out with our adventuring day planner. We're going to start with the first one with the crocodiles. So grabbing up our monster manual. Let's stat this bad boy out and get this adventure ready to go. And crocodile is going to be a 320, so part of the appendix. Now, of course, if you have something like Encounter Builder, 5e Encounter Builder, you can build all your encounters in there. But I really like to have notes for while I'm playing based on what we're building in the game. So that way it's not quite as static. Crocodiles are large beasts. Uh, they're unaligned. Their armor class is 12 with natural armor. Now their hit points, they average 19. Uh, they've got 3d10 plus 3. And because we've got two of them, I'm going to set those bad boys out, and I'm going to give them each 33 that I can subtract from. Speed is 20 feet on ground. 30 feet swim. I don't know why I did that. And their stats. We've got these right here. Not very intelligent, so they're more reactive. That's why I want to really look at a location where the players will have to kind of go into their lair, right? I want this to be a lair for the crocodiles. Even though they don't have lair actions, nothing like that, it will make a difference as we get into putting the notes in here. Um, I'll show you that here in just a moment. So skills, they've got uh, stealth plus two. Uh, they've got passive perception. of 10. Uh, we do know they are a uh, one-half CR. Uh, they can hold breath as a tactic. And that's for 15 minutes. Now actions, they've got a bite. Uh, this is plus four to hit. Now remember, our adventurers are second level, so plus four is pretty good, pretty good. Uh, this is five foot. 
So that's the challenge. They don't have a reach, so the player has got to go right by them or close to them, or they've got to swim up to them. So I've got to get the players into their element, or not the players, the characters, into their element so that the crocodiles can engage with the players. Um, their hit is uh, 1d10 plus 2 piercing. And target is grappled. So it's not super, super beneficial uh, for the players. If they get that grapple, I mean, that's a challenge right there. Um, and now the escape DC is 12. Um, and uh, if target fails, they're restrained. Very challenging for a party. The biggest aspect of this is as your players are going through these sewers and has the um, the interaction with these creatures in their environment, thinking about how we put them in place um, how we make it to where the player don't metagame. Um, you know, you can think about that a little bit, but overall, the best thing you can do is attempt a good setup and um, hope for the best. So as we get into the notes section here, this is where we start looking at, because I want this to be a layer type of thing, um, I do want to look at the treasure. So we're going to look at treasure hoard. And this is going to be for all the victims that the crocodiles have eaten. They have eaten a lot. Now we've already established there's a little bit of a black market trade here, um, as well as cultists moving into it. So it makes sense for, the, uh, for a treasure hoard to be down here. And uh, this will really help the... Um, the party go through and start getting some reward uh, for adventuring. This should sink their teeth into, uh, well, there's even more reward if we go through and do adventures. So we're going to continue to adventure and look for opportunity to adventure. So that's the goal. Um, so we're going to roll up what the treasure hoard is, and that is going to be One thousand four hundred copper pieces. Um, and we're going to do some silver here. That's going to be well. That's actually a lot. Seven hundred silver pieces, and then for gold pieces. That's going to be 70 gold pieces. Again, some of it makes sense because this is a wealthy town. There's a lot of trade and everything that goes in here. Now, if you didn't like this, you could do your individual instead and lower that down. It all depends on how much you want to um, you know, think about the environments and everything. For me, because this is the kind of big payoff, the big payoff is going to be here. Um, the others have not established their lair here yet. So they're still trying to set up their cult area. Um, so this is the big payoff. That's why I wanted to do the big funds here. And this is all um, loot in bags and waterlogged boxes from black market trade. And um, cultists who went astray. Easy. There is our big payoff. The interesting thing is they'll get that at the very beginning of the adventure. And then there isn't another big, giant, huge payoff. Now we do have to look at... Um, 
The additional table here does have a D100, so we're going to roll for that and see if they get gems or art objects or any magic items. So let's check and see. We got a 38, uh, which means they will get some gems. That's going to be 9. 10 gold piece gems. Now here I'm going to say these are fire agates. Um, from mountains to north. So if, if they show anybody or anything, notes for myself. This I want them to, I want to lead them further north into some adventure aspects. Uh, and then we get to roll 1d6 on uh, the magic item table A. So just for that we'll have a 5. Now this one here, that means we get to roll 5 times on magic table A. That's a lot for a second level. I don't like doing this much early, um, but for some reason these rolls always do it to me. So 71, there's going to be a spell scroll. Uh, this is a first level. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll get this figured out. I was not anticipating magic items. Darn those hordes. Um, I am going to go through and pull up just a first level spell. And I'm just doing all spells and I'm going to pick one at random. Uh, I'm going to go sort this by level. Pass the cantrips to level one. I'm going to go with the letter G. The letter G. Let's see what we've got in first level. There we go. And the letter G is going to be. Ooh. We are going to do Greece. It's a utilitarian type of one. Maybe they can use it against the cultists. All right, that's one. Now we got a 93, which is, oh man, spell scroll. Second level, man, they're just, they're going crazy. They're going to go crazy. So much magic already. And we are going to go with, um, let's go with C. C. Uh, let's go with Calm Emotions. Already, quite a bit. All right, uh, 29. It's going to be a Potion of Healing. That's three. 24, uh, also a potion of healing. Let's just roll our third, just so we know if it's a potion of healing as well, too. Uh, 47 would also be a potion of healing, times three. So there we go. We've got a big, giant horde of treasure for them to come across. Ooh. 
and already some magic items that they can start utilizing right away. Now these are all consumables, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, my guess is they'll hold on to at least two of the potions uh, until they're level 20. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. All right. Uh, so here we're going to do the cult fanatics, and we're going to do these all at once. So cult fanatic. And we'll do an S there. Uh, let's go to our cult fanatic. And these figures are pretty nasty individuals. So these are medium humanoid. I haven't decided the race on these yet. I haven't decided. Uh, armor class of 13, which is leather armor. Uh, hit points, 33 on average. That's 68 plus 6. So we'll pop those in. So we'll do solo. And then... Duo 1, Duo 2, and then speed 30 feet, 11, 14, 12, 10, 13, and 14 skills. They've got Deception plus four, which that first solo one might may, may try to deceive or persuade. The party. But the two previously and the previous adventure tried to as well. So hopefully the uh, players will have advantage on that. Uh, they've got... Uh, Passive Perception of 11, uh, Common, we know these are CR2, uh, they've got Dark Devotion, which means advantage on Save uh, versus Charm and Frightened. And they also have spell casting. This is fourth level wisdom. <coughs> uh, save DC is 11. They've got a plus three to hit. And in actions, they have. Uh, cantrip, which is at will, uh, light, sacred flame, and thaumaturgy. Uh, first, they have four slots, so I do four boxes so I can track when I use them. Uh, they have command. Inflict wounds and the shield of faith. So I'm going to underline both of those because I want my bad guys, especially these ones here, to utilize those right off the bat. That's the first action I'm going to go to for them. And then, second, they've got three slots. They've got old person and spiritual weapon. Now, depending on the order of initiative, they may do a spiritual weapon. We'll see. It all depends on how that initiative plays out. Um, and then they've also got a multi-attack. 
um, that's going to be two melee, which they will have dagger. Uh, that's going to be a plus four to hit, a five foot reach, uh, 1d4 plus two piercing. So my cult fanatics, now I want to have a little bit of dive into these fellows. We're going to give them just individual treasure. Um, at this one I'm not even going to roll, I'm going to use just the average. And they will have 14 silver pieces each. And I'm going to do a, another line there just to show that these are two different encounters. Now my cultists, as I think about it, I want to tie them back into uh, the forest. So I am actually going to add some notes here that um, they will have uh, items from the woods nearby, uh, including, uh, we will say, some decorative trinkets of leaves and twigs. Again, tying them into future adventures. I want the players to kind of follow the clues and go into the woods next. Um, now we've got our swarms of rats. of rats and this is a lot a lot of swarms of rats let's go into our swarm in the appendix where all our beautiful swarms are and swarm of rats so this is a medium Swarm of beasts. Ah, I got a little fly there. It's from my succulents, but they make me feel so good with all this greenery around. I don't think you can see it on camera, but my cacti are actually getting like massive. One of them is almost the size of my fist. It's pretty impressive. Uh, unaligned. Their armor class is 10. Hit points are average 24 that's 78 minus 7 oh I hate that math let's get that calc real quick 7 times 8 minus 7 is 49 now we've got 5 of these so we're going to separate these out and have 49 each. And get their stats in. Again, this sheet here allows me to, because I write it in pen, I can subtract as they're getting damage or anything like that, getting boosts, who knows? Um, you never know. But to be able to use pencil on that and then reuse the sheet should I need. And they are resistant. This is where it comes in and makes this even more challenging. To bludgeon, piercing, and slashing damage. So not even a magic bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing is going to help. They're just resistant. Um, they are immune to being charmed, frightened, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, 
restrained and stunned. They've got dark vision, 30 feet, and passive perception of 10. Now languages, they don't have any. We know they're one quarter CR. They do have keen smell. Uh, so that's advantage on wisdom, which is perception. Uh, checks that rely on smell. And they can also swarm. Uh, can occupy another creature's space. That's the important aspect because they can completely swarm my characters in the game and it's going to make it more challenging for the players to help each other out with that swarm. Uh, and then for their actions they've got a bite which is a plus two to hit which is zero feet. They've got to be swarmed. Uh, one target and that is going to be 2d6 piercing and then if swarm is at one half of hit point total it is a 1d6 piercing Now they won't have any treasure or anything like that, so I don't need to worry about that. I do want to add just a quick pencil note here, though, that I want them to be from different directions. And then lastly, we have our nine cultists. So our cultists are going to be in the sewers. They are setting up their cult sanctuary, their cult temple. And let's get into the cultists right after the cult fanatic or right before. Cultists. Now we know with this one here um, that we're going to have nine of them. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. So real quick I'm going to start sectioning this off. Just so I can make sure I have plenty of space for this. All right. Also medium humanoid and these ones we said were going to be neutral evil armor class of 12 that's leather armor their hit points 9 on average which is 2d8 which we know is 16 we'll pop those maxes in here that way we've got it scaled high. We can always scale it back should we need to uh, in the game. Which, depending if you have a player out, anything like that, you want to be able to scale it. And it's always easier to scale down than up when you've got your sheets pre-built. Especially if you're using a GM screen. Pretty average stuff. The skills deception plus two, religion plus two, passive perception 
of 10 and common. We know they are a 1 8 CR. Uh, they do have dark devotion. Uh, that has advantage on saves versus charm and frightened for actions they will have a scimitar which is a plus three to hit five foot reach one target and that is a 1d6 plus 1 slashing. Now we will give them just a quick, again, super generic amount of treasure. Your average is 17 copper pieces each. Not very much, but it's enough to uh, get them what they need in the thing. I'm also going to have a note that they are setting up area with um, forest foliage. Again, bringing back that forest aspect. I want that to be a big impact for the characters to see that they are doing something foresty. That should lead them to want to go and explore the full forest. Why are they setting up this forest stuff in the sewers? Well, we should go to the forest and check out what's going on there. Hopefully, that's the goal. So, just like that, we have built our second level adventure. Now, I do want to go through and pencil out a little bit of a map and tie in where we're going to run into the crocodiles at the beginning. Um, how I'm going to have them have a little bit of sense of comfort going in there, but uh, ultimately have to confront the alligators of the sewers, um, where they're going to run into the cult fanatic. Maybe he is also breaking in from above, and they come across him as he is coming down. Um, maybe he's got part of his uh, jerk and caught in a manhole cover or something. I don't know. We'll have to figure that out on the map. Um, but then going into an area where uh, perhaps from that aspect they know they've got to go to this section where multiple sewers come together and that's where the swarm of rats come in and get them. Uh, they ultimately go and confront the cultists. After confronting the cultists uh, they go and confront the cult fanatics at the end. So a good adventure. Hopefully they're able to uh, really take the aspects of the forest and decide to go explore in there and clear out and see what's going on and um, we can really guarantee that by dropping enough good clear hints that these folks are new to the sewers they are not fully set up they're kind of wandering around uh, building an area of their own uh, that's very forest themed so that's the goal I hope this video was helpful and insightful and really driving creativity. Until next time, make sure you're building your adventures with gusto and really utilizing all the creativity at your fingertips and creating adventures that are going to be astounding for your players and challenging for your characters. Have a great evening.